you. Um, I'm actually going to start off with a song today. Sometimes we do a little video sing along, but this time I'm doing a song that goes with my talk here. Um, so this, uh, the song, the lyrics are written by Peter S. Beagle. They're part of his novel, The Last Unicorn. Um, he didn't print a tune with it, but it's often sung to the tune of the traditional song, The Ash Grove, which is how I'm going to sing it. Um, I'm going to accompany myself with an instrumental version by Elisa Jones, but I doubt that'll come through since I'm using a headset playing it on my phone. It's just to guide me along. <laughs> All right. It's a quick little song. When I was a young man and very well thought of, I couldn't ask aught that the ladies denied. I nibbled their hearts like a handful of raisins, and I never spoke love, but I knew that I lied. But I said to myself, are ah, they none of them know? The secret I shelter and savor and save. I wait for the one who will see through my seeming and I'll know when I love by the way I behave. The years drifted over like clouds in the heavens. The ladies went by me like snow on the wind. I charmed and I cheated, deceived and dissembled. And I sinned and I sinned and I sinned and I sinned. But I said to myself, are ah, they none of them see? There's part of me pure as the whisk of a wave. The my lady is late, but she'll find I've been faithful, and I'll know when I love by the way I behave. At last came a lady, both knowing and tender, saying you're not at all what they take you to be. I betrayed her before she had quite finished speaking, and she swallowed cold poison and jumped in the sea. And I say to myself, when there's time for a word, as I gracefully grow more debauched and depraved, a love may be strong, but a habit it is stronger and I knew when I loved by the way I behaved yes I knew when I loved by the way I behaved so that is a, a little bit of a kick in the pants about the power of habit that I like a lot um, it uh, it illustrates how our habits can completely override our best intentions, our ethics, our best interests. Um, and so we really need something to help us figure out how to do better with habits than just going, yeah, I'm gonna do better someday. Um, so I'd like to start off um, by saying the, uh, the biggest thing that gets in the way of creating the right habits that will better shape our health, our career, our relationships, whatever it is we're trying to change, the biggest thing that gets in the way is a misunderstanding of how habits work. And so I want to share this book, um, just a few high points from it. It's it's a big book, but it's really easy to read. It's um, it, it's, it actually is a really quick read, really easy to use. It's full of exercises and examples that I can't possibly share in about 20 minutes. Um, so I really encourage you to get it yourself here. It's got this little slidey thing. It's, this book will change your life, which makes it a lif in Douglas Adams terms. That's his word for a book that says this book will change your life on the cover. Uh, but this is what the cover looks like underneath. Um, BJ Fogg is the head of the behavior lab at Stanford University. He knows his stuff. He's probably the world lead expert in habit forming and breaking at this point. Um, so uh, the problem with habits that we often have is if we have trouble starting a habit or sticking to a habit or breaking a habit, we often think of this as a personal failing. It's a moral failing. I don't have enough willpower. I'm not motivated enough. I'm lacking in the essential virtue of temperance. Um, 
but the thing is that habit building and therefore temperance can be learned with the combination of the rationality and compassion we strive for in this church. Uh, BJ Fogg has done the research to figure out what is actually effective at changing behavior, which is often very different from kind of mainstream understanding and, and popular wisdom. Um, and it absolutely requires compassion, not blame for ourselves and anyone else we're helping make changes. So um, I wanna start off with uh, the most important thing to understand that is wrong about popular wisdom about habits is that motivation is not the key. Um, motivation is actually the hardest thing to change and thinking that that's what you have to change is gonna lead to a lot of pain, a lot of frustration, a lot of failure. Um, so I'm gonna share with you the fog behavior model which, of which uh, motivation is just one piece. So the basic idea is this, that uh, M plus A plus P leads to B. Motivation plus ability plus a prompt equals behavior. You have to want to do the thing be able to do the thing and have some kind of a prompt to nudge you to do the thing, and then it'll happen. If any one of these pieces is missing, the behavior is not gonna happen. If you don't actually want to do it enough to do it, it's not gonna happen. If you can't do it, it's not gonna happen. If you don't have anything to nudge you to do it, it's not gonna happen. We need all of these things. And there is a diagram that can be very helpful in understanding the uh, the interactions among these. If down here is um, the ability, this is how much you want to do the thing. This is how much you don't want to do the thing. And this is, uh, a, this is, oh, I'm sorry. I labeled that don't want. I'll make this one uh, motivation. So motivation is how much you want to or don't want to do the thing. And over here we have ability, that's you can do the thing or you can't do the thing. If we get a prompt, that, that given behavior that we're being prompted to could fall anywhere in this range. It could be something that you really don't want to do and it's really, really hard, you really can't do it, would be way down here. Something that's very, very easy that you really want to do would be way up here. And there is an action line, a threshold over which we will act and under which we will not act. So if something's very easy and very much desired, it's going to be way up here, way above the action line. Of course, you'll do it. And if it's really, really hard and you don't want to do it, it's going to be way down here and you're not going to do it. So the key to developing a habit that you're currently not doing because it's down in here somewhere is to either get yourself to want to do it more or be able to do it more. You also need the prompt to make it happen at all. Making yourself want to do something more is almost impossible. So what's usually more useful is making yourself able to do it more. Now you might be able to do that by acquiring abilities or skills, becoming stronger or gaining more knowledge, getting better tools, that's sometimes possible. But the most useful way to make yourself want to do something and be able to do something that you currently can't is to make the task smaller. Make the task easier to bring it up over the threshold so that you'll actually do it. And once you've done it enough times, it becomes a habit and you can build on that and make it a bigger task. That's the core concept in tiny habits is make the task smaller and easier to start with. So we want to have we want to have it small enough that we're motivated to do it and we can do it, find ourselves the right prompt, and that will lead to the behavior. The basic structure of a behavior in this design is you find an anchor moment to tie it to, you perform the tiny behavior, and then you celebrate it. So it's A, B, C, anchor moment, behavior, celebrate. And you do that every time you do this habit. 
I'm going to go through the steps for how you design and establish a habit. There's way more detail about how to do this, lots of exercises about how to do it in the book itself. So I'm just covering some basics here. Highly encourage you to go find the original and read it all. Um, so step, there are seven steps to the entire habit design and acquisition process. The first one is to clarify the aspiration. Look at the area you want to improve in. Figure out what your actual goal is. For instance, if you're thinking, um, oh, I should really uh, lose some weight or something like that. That's not really an aspiration. That's something you're thinking you should do. Figure out what your actual aspiration is. Maybe it's to be healthier so that you feel better. Um, maybe it's to have more uh, endurance so that you can play with your kids and have fun with your friends. Um, there could be a lot of different reasons why you're thinking you should do this one thing. Figure out what your overall goal is, what actually motivates you. And maybe it is, maybe that's, maybe that particular action you were thinking of is in line with that. Maybe it's not important to you. Maybe something else is. So to, once you figure out what your goal is, um, you want to put that in the middle of a chart. Let's say I want to be healthier. And my, my motivation in that has a lot of pieces to it. Maybe I want to have more time to live, you know, and spend time with my family over time. Maybe there are things that I want to do that right now I can't do physically. Um, maybe I'm getting warnings from my doctor that I'm on the verge of diabetes and I really need to change uh, my exercise and uh, nutrition habits. There could be a lot of reasons. But let's say I've decided that the core of what I want to do is just be healthier. Now, that's very abstract. That's really general. You want to design some habits that are really specific. This is where you write what he calls a swarm of bees, B for behavior. Write all the things you can think of that you might do that would contribute to that. You might write in um, uh, run a marathon. It's okay if they're not realistic now. It's okay if they're things you can't do right now. It's okay if they're things you can do and you're already doing even. Um, eat five vegetables a day, um, join a gym. Um, you can think of whatever you want and all of these things are gonna be on this chart leading toward be healthier. Some of them may be implausible, some of them may be obvious. Just, this is the brainstorming session, write them all in there, get a whole cloud, a whole swarm of bees on your chart. Then you take all of those, maybe write them on index cards or post-its or something so that you can rearrange them. And you arrange them on a chart based on doable, not doable. Let me grab a different, I do blue here. Um, doable up here, not doable down here. Now this is kind of a combination of the motivation and the ability, because uh, it might be you can't do it because you can't get yourself to do it, or it might be you can't do it because it's just really fricking physically, practically hard. Either way, you put it on the do, doable, not doable scale here. Some of the things that you charted out may be really easy, some of them may be really hard. So you put them vertically lined up like that. Then you also sort them this way by not likely to help, likely to help. And what you're gonna end up with is you may have ideas scattered all over this chart. You wanna focus in on the ones over here, the golden behaviors that you think you can do and you think are likely to help. You will probably find there are several in there and charting things out this way helps you zero in on, okay, these are gonna be worth trying. You might change your mind later. You might think of some new ideas. You might go, oh, I thought this was doable and it really isn't. Or actually, you know, now this other thing I thought was not doable or thought was not likely to help. I think it might now that I've had more experience with this. You can always change your mind. And that's part of the key to this whole process is you can always change it. If you find something's not working, you can change it. If you want to try something new, you can change it. You're never locked in. Um, so once you've found some golden behaviors, so far we've, one, clarified the aspiration, two, explored behavior options. Now, three, match with specific behaviors. 
find something in that quadrant, those golden behaviors that you want to try. Um, you want something that feels doable and worthwhile to you. Just pick one for now. You could pick three. He says pick one to three at a time to work with. Um, but for now, I'm going to say just one to simplify describing it. Match with specific behaviors. So you're going to find one that seems like a good fit for you to try. Step four, this is key. Make it tiny. If you've decided that something that is going to help with your health is to run, don't decide, okay, I'm going to run five miles every day. I've never done this before, but I'm going to start running five miles every day. You are never going to get yourself to start that. It's not going to work. And then you're going to feel bad because you failed and you're lacking in motivation. And you're a bad person and all these horrible messages that we get from our society in the back part of our brain that says bad things about us. And it'll discourage you further. So don't try to do something big. We'll work up to something big. Start with such a small step that it would be just absurd not to do it. Ridiculously small. Um, for instance, if you're trying to get yourself to floss your teeth, say, I'm just going to floss one tooth. You know, it, it kind of hurts and it's uncomfortable and irritating when I floss my teeth. I'm just going to floss one. I don't have to floss all of them. If that's still too much, just get out the floss, set it down, put it back in the cupboard. <laughs> um, whatever it takes to make it small enough for you to actually do the task is the right size. If it seems ridiculously small, you found the right size. If it's like, yeah, maybe I could get myself to do that. See if you can make it even smaller. You can make tasks smaller by making them a much smaller amount of the same thing. For instance, doing one push-up instead of 25. You can make it just a piece of the task you're targeting. Like the very first step, I'm going to put on my shoes. I'm not going to go for a run. I'm just going to put on my running shoes. I can take them off again. So you find a way to make that task really, really teeny so that it's going to be easy to get up over the motivation and the action and the uh, ability portions of that. Of course, I can do that. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Here's the prompt. I'm going to do this silly, tiny thing. Find a good prompt for it. This is step, step five. You need to find an existing prompt um, that will remind you to do the thing. It could be something that happens regularly, um, you know, when the noon bell goes off or when I wake up in the morning or um, when I sit down at my desk. Could be something you're doing anyway, could be something that's external but is a reliable event, or it could be something that you can set up as an easy reminder. I'm going to set an alarm for this to happen or uh, I'm going to have someone remind me if you have someone who help you with it. Uh, not necessarily a good idea to farm out your prompts, though. You really want it to be something that's going to always happen. Um, BJ Fogg set up one when he started doing this research. He was experimenting with things. He wanted to do push-ups, so he said he'd do two push-ups every time he went to the bathroom. means he's doing them several times a day. He goes to the bathroom, he flushes the toilet, he does two push-ups. Easy to remember, it's happening constantly. Um, you could set up a reminder like when I drink my morning coffee, I'm going to also eat a piece of fruit or uh, when I sit down at my desk, I'm going to check my to do list. So you link these target behaviors to an existing signal or one that you can set up very easily. And that's your prompt. Step six is every time you manage to do your tiny habit, celebrate. This is really important because this is the part where we link up the action with the reward system of our brain, so we'll do it again. So at first, you're just doing this tiny little thing. It might seem a little silly to celebrate, but you know what? You are starting this process. You are beginning to change your own behavior, and you have done the thing. For now, getting out your floss or putting on your shoes or whatever it is, is the thing. That is the goal, and you're doing it, so celebrate. People can find different ways of celebrating that moment. Some people will go, yes! Some people will go, yay, me. Some people just smile quietly to themselves and go, yes, I am a good person. I did the thing. Um, but find some kind of a gesture or a thing to say to yourself, do a little dance, whatever it is to find what he calls that feeling of shine. The shine is the, yeah, I'm doing great feeling, the feeling of accomplishment when you've achieved something. 
Um, so we want to get that for ourselves and we want to get it as quickly and as frequently as possible in order to make this habit happen. Um, it doesn't matter that we're getting that feeling out of something small rather than something big. We don't want to have to wait till we do something big. We want to accomplish something very small, congratulate ourselves, celebrate ourselves, and that will help us build on it. That's how our brains work. They go, oh, oh, this is a good thing. Okay, I better do more of it. They'll make it easier next time. Um, and the seventh step is troubleshoot, iterate, and expand. So if you find this is not working, if you still can't or won't do the thing, you can make the task tinier still. Maybe you thought that uh, getting out the floss would be enough, but you can't even make yourself get out the floss. Well, put it on the counter, make the task touching it. Uh, you can always make the task smaller. If it's too small, well, it'll be easy and you'll get bored and you'll move on, you'll make it bigger. That's totally fine, but make sure it's small enough to get started. Um, if, you, if making it tinier is not quite doing it, maybe you need to find a different prompt. Maybe this isn't really the best time of day to do this thing, or you're frequently getting distracted right when that prompt happens. Find a different prompt that fits better. Experiment. Um, or maybe this habit just isn't going to work. Try a different habit off your chart or come up with a new chart. Keep experimenting. Once the habit's well established and starts to feel really boringly easy, then you can start to think about expanding it. Habits will naturally grow into larger versions of themselves where you're doing more or multiply into whole sets of behaviors that kind of go together and support the same thing once you get them established. Um, don't push that too soon. Make sure you're really reliably doing the thing and you'll start to feel an impulse to do more because it's like, this is ridiculous. Of course I can do one push-up. I've gotten so much stronger over the past month. I've been doing a push-up. I want to do three. <laughs> you know, um, it, It'll start to feel silly to be doing so little and you'll want to do more and go ahead and do that. But count as a, as a, as a success, even if you're still doing just the tiny step. You can also begin to add more habits. Once you've got things really well established, you can go back and start another one to three habits at a time. You can go back to your original chart and go, what else can I do to support this goal? Or you can go, hey, you know what? I want to work on a whole different goal. Let me chart that one out. Um, you can keep building on this. The more successes you have, the easier it will get. And it is really, really key to keep congratulating yourself and if you don't do the thing, that's okay. That just means you don't have the connections quite yet. Keep trying, keep on experimenting with what works for you. It's not a failure of motivation. It's a failure of figuring out how to make the motivation, less motivation necessary. Um, motivation is a particularly tricky thing to get if you are, well, this is not in the book, but willpower is actually brain glucose. So for instance, if you are trying to eat less sugar and you don't have the willpower, that's because you don't have enough glucose in your brain, that's going to be really hard to overcome. So start elsewhere, start with small habits that support what you want to do and find ways to make it not take motivation because that is a losing battle. Making it take more and more motivation just means you're going to fail eventually. Um, so that's the key. He goes into how to break habits as well. It's basically taking them apart using the same steps. Take away the prompt, make it harder, uh, make it less desirable. Don't celebrate. It's you just do the opposite. I really, really encourage you all to read the actual book and do the exercises in it. I'm planning to go back and read it again and start doing all the exercises bit by bit and tweak some habits of my own and help my family with tweaking some habits. I've already started applying some of what I learned. And I think this is really exciting stuff. And one of the things that is most exciting about it is that the whole idea of habits and like self-control and temperance is such a kind of dour subject area where people are like, okay, I just have to knuckle down and do this really hard thing. And this takes that whole construct apart. Um, it is not about doing the hard thing. It's about finding out how to make the hard thing easy so that you'll do it. And then you can work up to harder things. Um, so be easy on yourself, make it easy and you will succeed and it will change your life in so many ways. He has lots and lots of stories about people who changed one little habit that made it easier to change a whole bunch of other things. Um, so that's where we are. 
you can change, you can teach yourself to be better at changing by changing, it really builds on itself. Thank you.